message from this morning. Can you turn to your neighbor, tell them one of the open things in Pastor Shabelli's message this morning?
Father's love Destined to die Poured out for all mankind God's only Son Perfect and spotless One He never sinned Suffered as if he did. All the glory, every victory is yours.
So awesome is your name. God, there's nobody like you. Thank you.
Tonight there is uh, prayer and praise, so Pastor Minicello is here to, sh- to lead us in that. And what a great, thank you so much for the worship, it's so great, it's, it's a highlight, isn't it? I think it's amazing to come into God's house and worship. Thanks for your prayers, your great love faithfulness, Phil Winslow and his beautiful family, and uh, so many amazing people, great people in this room tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Pastor Chevelle gave an excellent word this morning. It was so uh, open door, open heaven, open heaven, right, open door. Uh, open Bible, uh, open, what was the other one? Open heart, open heart surgery, <laughs> open heart. I, I bought a present for Steve Andalonis at the flea market. You want to see it? Okay. Okay. Uh, this is for his birthday. Uh, they're buying a new house. Christmas, Easter all rolled together. And there it is. Would you like to come up and receive it? Don't say I never gave you anything. There you go. Thank you for your service. Uh, <laughs> uh, so Matt, Matt did the artwork on that. So Matt and Tally, they're great, great family. All right. So for our message tonight, uh, it's a dark subject, uh, but an important one. But let's lighten it up in the beginning and understand that God has made us in his image and we are so uh, honored. Is this Kim over there? No, sorry. Is it? Oh, good to see you. Is your husband with you? Okay, is he still walking the earth? Praise the Lord. Ray and Kim, thank you. Jones, give him a hand. Wow, beautiful. All right, so we are made in God's image. What an amazing uh, reality that is. So we have God. We have three persons. We have God. We have angels, a whole category of created beings. They are sometimes called watchers. In the book of Daniel, they are called watchers. I like that word. They are, they are observing and they are watching. They are angels in heaven. God made them, it looks like, at the beginning of the creation of the world, the universe. He made angels 
And then when he flung out the universe, uh, or however he made it, they sang, and that's in Job 38, verse 7. And then we have the birth of evil, which is a mystery, mystery of iniquity. Evil was in the heart of Lucifer at some time in the history, and he they left the angels, the third of the angels. He, God allowed him to propagate his lie and his pride in heaven, which is a mystery. He trafficked in it in Ezekiel chapter 28. He was given, he was given the right to communicate, and he did so in heaven. It looks like that. That's how we read it. He trafficked in it, in his iniquity, in heaven, and a third of the angels fell. And they came here to this planet. This planet was not given to angels, but it actually was given to man. Sometime, we don't know how the history goes, but God made man on the sixth day and made him in, in God's image. So we are very honored to be made like God and one with the woman. So we are one. This is one unit. And they were to keep the garden, and Satan came into the garden. So we have three, uh, three in persons, so to speak. We have God, who is three persons. We have man. And then we have demonic forces in the world. And so when we read the book of Job, we are, we are fascinated to learn about this world that we don't see very clearly and understand it, but it's revealed to us in the scripture. Sometimes, like when, when the Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthians and said, there is dissension amongst you, and he basically said, get it straightened out. He didn't say, and cast out the spirit of dissension. He just said, you folks have oneness. When there was incest, he said, correct that. Correct the incense. He didn't say, cast out the spirit of incest. And so we, in, in our Western culture, we understand that because rarely do we talk about the devil as being a real person and the demons in the armies of the devil that we read about in the Bible. That being said, Paul didn't overdo it. We could say, like, overdo it and say that everything that man does that is wrong and sinful is because of the devil. No, it's because we have a sin nature. We make decisions. We have bad habits. We say the bad words, we make wrong decisions, and we sin, and we own the sin in Romans 7. It's when I sin, it's, it's, it's I, I am, verse 18, and I don't know how. Let's make a note of it just so I'm not misunderstood here. Romans 7. Verse 18, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform it, perform that which good I, is good, I find not. So he is saying, uh, I'd like to do good things, but I can't find my way to do them. But did, he didn't say it's the devil that's preventing me from doing it. But it's me, O oh, wretched man that I am. So we have the study of the man here, but tonight I want to do the study of the devil. And one of the reasons is because in the book of Job, in chapter 1, we see the devil and his authority and power and work in the world. What powers he has. And this in context to the sad, uh, tragic killings in the state of Maine this past week. And to think of how did that happen. 
I think the man might have been mentally sick. I understand that he was. I think the man might have been very lonely, deranged, jealous. He went to social events, a bowling alley for young people that particular night. Whether he knew it or not, I don't know, and I'm not a, attempting to explain his behavior, but I would like to suggest tonight that we would understand that life is more than just flesh and blood and the sin natures of man. But there's actually the work of evil that happens in the world. Now, notice something here. This is a little diagram. I think you can follow it with me. So we have, uh, um, let's do a timeline, big timeline. The end of time is a thousand years. This is called the millennium. Where is the devil in the millennium? Let's turn there and read it. Revelation <clears throat> chapter 20. Verse 1. <clears throat> I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Yes, Lord. Get rid of the devil, Lord. We don't need the devil on our planet this is your planet. You gave it to us. Christ is reigning. Where is the devil? Verse 2. He took hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, cast him into the bottomless pit, shut him up, set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more. Now, uh, till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. By the way, when he does get out for a short season at the end here, he is released. He brings a conspiracy of evil around the world against Christ and his kingdom. And we will see again the power of this fallen creature. We will see again clearly what he's capable of doing. So, uh, this, we should go back in time now. We will go back before Christ to the book of Job. And we will read about him. Now, what he does here, he requests Job. It's very interesting. I'm just making these little dots for the fun of it. <laughs> I don't know. Just think about that time there, okay? Uh, he requests during the time of Jesus here, did Satan request anybody? Yes, he did. He requested Peter. And Jesus told Peter that. Satan has desired to have you. And you don't know what that meant. Did he go to God and say, I want Peter? Because that's what he said about Job. When he went before God and God said, have you considered Job my servant? And Satan said, let me have him, in my words. Let me have him. Can I have him? Guys, I'll bring him down. I will bring him down. He will curse you. So this is the story. Now notice something. What happens in this history here, like through history with the work of the devil, does not happen in the thousand years, he's, he's out of the picture. That's why there is like a paradise on the earth. That's why there is not the murder, not the lying, not the deceit, not the pride, not the error. There, there is a different society here during that thousand years, and God is showing us like God, God shows us who the devil is and actually, uh, I, you know, many other things. How great God is, how beautiful he is, how loving, loving he is, how gracious he is, how much he desires for us, how much he builds us. Look at Ezekiel 36, 11 with me for a second. Ezekiel 36. I just discovered this verse recently, yeah, this morning, 
3611. And I will multiply upon you men and beast, and they shall increase and bring fruit. And I will settle you after your old estates, and I will do better unto you than at your beginnings. And you shall know that I am the Lord. I will do better unto you than your beginnings. Now, where do we see that? Well, in this picture here, up on the, on the screen here. That, that, that's what's coming. It's better. There's a better country, better covenant, better promises. There's a better resurrection. How about in your personal life? They, they give the old, the, the bad wine up front, and then with Jesus, the better wine comes later. How about in your personal life, you got saved, and you're walking in faith, and God is saying, I got something better for you. How about in the book of Job? Uh, Job, you know, Satan is going to have you, but not totally because he's on my leash. Yay. Now, we better process that thought here for a second. I would draw it like this. Here's the world. Here's God who is almighty. Almighty. And, um, and then we have the world, the atmosphere around the world where Satan lives in this world. He's the cosmos diabolicus. He's the world ruler, the cosmo creator. He is the God of this world. Yeah, he is the one that ha can deceive the nations and is. I, I believe he is deceiving the nations in, today in Revelation 12, 9. I really believe that this is a real thing. And during the time of Christ, it really surfaced a lot. Because he cast out demons. In the book of Acts, we see it in Acts 8, Acts 16. We see confrontation with demons. And we, we, uh, we understand that uh, in our modern age, in the world that we live in, the world generally doesn't agree. They don't believe it. But it's Halloween. Aren't they like playing the game? Yeah, but it's only a game in their mind. How about in the movies? How about the demonic movies that you see? Yeah, I don't know how they see it. They are afraid. They are maybe terrorized. Maybe they believe it to a degree. Where it's a, they don't understand it. Hey, we are born-again Christians who are serious about it. And it's fun. Guys, it's serious. But it's incredible to think that God would put us here and have these powerful spirits under our feet and be walking through their territory. Now, let's say a couple of things about them. Look at our, our diagram. So his reign is in the world like this. He's in this atmosphere, and he has authority here. And it's called, we could say that he is mighty, but he is not almighty. But he does have power. And we'll talk about it in a few ways here. Go, turn to jo Job with me in chapter 1. <clears throat> Verse 6. What can he do in this atmosphere? There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Now, that needs some explanation. I'm not capable of giving that to you accurately. I don't understand. Maybe because God does not tolerate evil in principle. But there was a day when he allowed Satan to come into his presence. Was that in the third heaven? I doubt it. I, perhaps the meeting was done in the atmosphere of this planet. I don't know. We, it's not told and explained. But no, I don't think Satan just has access to God and go before him whenever he pleased or wherever he wants to go. He is limited to this earth. This is part of his fall. He has re the reality of his realm is here. It's not in outer space. By the way, there, are, there, are, there is information, you can Google it and search it out, 
Um, I should do it, actually, I have a little bit, but basically it reads this way. Astronauts that have left this atmosphere have like a universal testimony that when they leave this Earth and they go into outer space, it's like, um, they, it's uh, overwhelmingly blessed. Like they experience the presence of God. They are overwhelmingly convinced and persuaded of the existence of God and the worship of God. And some of them have returned and become evangelists and born-again Christians and so on. And I believe that, that this world is under oppression. The human heart has sinned. We have been brought into like a negative way of living and thinking, a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety, a lot of worry, a lot of human living in an atmosphere that is we don't know how much or how it is, but we know that in the millennium, you may not believe me now, but you got to argue that in the millennium, it'll be radically different because the devil will be in the bottomless pit. And the demonic world that we know of right now, and we were born into it, is, uh, is going to change. That'll be amazing. Uh, so when the devil went before God, the angels are there, and the devil comes in, and then the Lord says to him, where are you coming from? In verse 7, the Lord said unto Satan, whence comest thou? You know, I'll just make a couple of personal comments here. Where are you coming from? Maybe another way of saying, where's your home? Where's your headquarters? Where are you coming from? And his answer is, answered Satan, answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro in the earth. That's my territory and from walking up and down in it. You're not sitting down? No, I'm busy. I'm busy, I'm working. I'm walking to and fro. These are my words. In my heart, I want to spread around the world the rebellion that I have in my heart against you. I want to bring it all over the world, and I am doing it. That's my mission. I'm an evangelist, the devil, with another message. You cannot be trusted. I know who you really are. I hate you, and so on. Incredible evil in the mind of this creature, and he's busy. But they agree on something. This is interesting. The Lord and Satan agree on something. Look at verse 8. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth? Perfect and upright man, one that fears God and avoids evil. Now, what kind of person was Job? Was he good or bad? Good. He was very good. He was a righteous man. He was a very good man. Uh, so I think the devil goes after very bad men, but he already has them. Very bad men, but then he goes after very good men because that's how he can ridicule God and show that they're not really that good. Here's a thing, little picture about in a word about, about uh, Job and God. Here's Job, and uh, this is God. And Job could love God in the heart, in the middle, the person of God. Job could love God in the person, or like, right, he could love God because he gives Job good stuff, big family, House, goats, cows, sheep, possessions, land, territory, health, everything 
that people desire to have in their personal life, they could get it if they pray to God and they know God or walk with God or trust God. But if they love God, then they could lose everything. Because if we lose everything and our heart is on God and we worship God, then we're not worshiping those things. We're worshiping God. But God gave us those things. Yes, he gave uh, those things to us different times, maybe, or not, but he can, but then they can also be gone. And what do we have? But nothing, or we have God. So Satan and God, this is interesting. Here's Satan over here. There's Job, and here's God. And Satan says, doesn't really, he doesn't really serve you. It's like a deal he has. He, he is serving you because of what you give him. But you take that stuff away and he'll curse you. Verse 9. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for no reason, for naught? Has not thou made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he has on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth your hand now and touch all that he has and he will curse you to your face. On this point, this is interesting, on this point, Satan and God agree. Guys, we agree, too. We understand this. In our little picture here, if you can follow, follow it with me, that we know, like, I could love my wife because she is beautiful, but if she loses her beauty, do I still love her? Or I could, I could love my church because of what it gives me, but if it fails to give it to me, I don't love it anymore. And I will love God, and as long as he gives me what, I, what really makes me happy, then my happiness is my God and not God. Right? God knows this. Satan knows this. Doesn't he? He's saying it. He's saying, you touch his stuff, he'll curse you. The Lord said, okay, game on. Let's go. And now comes the leash part. You can touch his stuff, but you got to save his life. That's in chapter 2. Let's read it here. It says in verse 11, But put forth your hand, touch all that he has, he will curse you. The Lord said, Behold, Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Do you know what? Satan... It looks like he has a lot of power, doesn't it? It looks like he can do a lot of damage. There's a war in the Middle East now. Could be a war coming here. Could be incredibly evil things that could happen. By the way, I want to say something about the leash that God has on Satan. He says you can have him, but you can't take his life. Now, I want to say, I want to say that you know, like fish, fish in an aquarium, right? They can only swim so far. And Satan, Satan can operate in the aquarium. He is limited. And how big is that aquarium? And what is it that God is allowing Satan to do? I believe that every day Satan would love to be showing his power much more than he is today. I believe what the murder that happened in Maine, it could happen in every state, in every city, every day of the year for 10 years if Satan had his way. Doesn't happen. What happened to the Twin Towers in New York, he would like that to happen to every bridge, every tower, every building. He'd like to destroy every family. He'd like to bring such misery into this world, and he has the power to do it. He has the power to do it. I believe that, but he can't. 
because of God. God is more powerful. God says that only here, not farther, right? So that's what happened. Look at the tragic things that happened. There was a day, verse 13, when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. There came a messenger unto Job and said, and he explains it. I don't know that I should read the whole text. Why not? Verse 14, there came a messenger unto Job. Now, in every one of these stories of tragedy, house collapse, invasion by a marauding band of murderers, like tragic, horrible murder, fire, destruction, there's always somebody survives to bring the message. There's always one that survives to bring the message. And I think that's like Satan, too. You'll kill everybody but one to bring the bad news. One to bring the message. So we have this story here. Let's go to a couple of points. It says, verse um, 15, the Sabians fell upon them, took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. I only am escaped alone to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God has fallen from heaven and has burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell you. While he was yet speaking. Do you know, this is also like the devil, isn't it? One after the other, after the other, after before you hang up the phone, there's another one and another one and another one. Maybe we could take one. But could we take two bad reports? Maybe we could take two, but could we take three? Verse 17. While he was yet speaking, there came another. and said the Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped to tell you. While he was yet speaking, there came another, said your sons and your daughters were eating and drinking, wine in their eldest brother's house, and behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness, smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead, and I only am escaped alone to tell you. And Job arose and rent his mantle, shaved his head, fell down upon the ground and worshipped. Now let's look at that for a second, evil. Was this really from God? Yes, yes, and no. God is almighty. God is good. God is rich, abundant. But there must be something in the mind of God that allowed this to happen that would result in something good. But what is it? Why, why in the mind of God would he allow this evil to happen to this man? And I'm sure there are people in Maine today and actually everywhere in the world that could say, why? What's in the mind of God? Now here, we'll say just a couple things about that. We should be careful if this happens to us. That we need to be careful to say, I don't understand. I cannot get it but I am going to trust. I'm going to, I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to cry a lot, and he does. He, he, he is, we, we are not talking about being stoic or being non-emotional or trying to keep a stiff upper lip, trying to behave and pretend like it's okay when it isn't. It isn't okay. If something very, very bad has happened in my life, something very, very sad, very powerful, very evil has happened in my life, did God do it? Of course, because he's almighty, then he has allowed it. But we would like to know, like, why? But let's make a point here. 
when you see evil happening in the world, step back and be careful to keep it a mystery. We don't have answers. We don't have pad answers. We, we could quote Bible verses, and Job did that, and his three friends, and, but we, we want to be careful with this because God he is almighty, and he has made us in his image, and he wants to walk us through and teach us something in our trouble and in our pain, and he does with Job. So we have what we could call, I think it was, it's Timothy Keller who calls it the early Job, early Job, and then the later Job. What does it mean? It's in the book, in the history, we have the first chapters, let's say three, three through to 37, uh, 31. And then later we have Job, and we see how he's processing. It's actually 38 to 42. And he has gotten real quiet, put his hand to his mouth, repents. What does he repent for? for? Uh, just things that were said, how he has been feeling. It's all okay, because God is saying, he is my servant Job. Because, in effect, this is who he is, this one here. He is this one that knows God and loves God. But God is showing something, like in the world, showing something to us who are reading it. He is showing something to the devil that actually I have put into this man, this capability, this heart, this faith, this trust, and he actually knows me. And he's trusting me. This is the famous Proverbs, I mean, Job 13, 15. Though he slay me, yet I will trust him. So he's kind of getting in that place where, yes, I am. But I want to go back to the work of the devil for a few moments here. I hope this isn't getting too crazy for you to follow. What can he do into us? Physically, he can hurt us. Physical ailments. This is Acts 10, 38. Jesus healed. Uh, he healed people who were afflicted by the devil. There was that woman bent over like a hairpin, just totally bent over for how many years? Was it 18 years? And, say, and Jesus healed healed her and he said it was the devil that had her folded over like that. That was the devil that did that. And he rebuked the devil and healed her. There are physical things that, that people go through in life. Let's make a list here. There is the physical uh, problems and ailments. There are like social uh, phenomena that come from the devil that uh, groups of people could attack or hurt. There are bad governments that are from the devil that could uh, oppress people and hurt people. And then there is um, Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, they lied to the Holy Spirit. He said, the devil has put in your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. That could the devil put something in my heart? Uh, yes, he can. And then the fourth thing, can he speak to us? Can he speak to us? How? Is it through the air, through electronically to our brain? How do we hear from the devil? I, I do not know, but we know that the devil spoke to Jesus in Matthew 4. Uh, we, we know that um, uh, sa Satan went into the heart of Judas Iscariot. And... Um, and we can imagine, um, oh, I remember, yeah, now, David numbered the people. He was tempted by Satan to number the people. He was told to do that, and he received it, and he did it, but it was the devil, and, and so we see that working work happening. Okay, so let's go back and finish up here. We have this one. 
Okay. So, Job is suffering a lot. He says, naked came I, verse 21, Job 1, from my mother's womb, naked shall I return thither. You know, I, I heard about one of our Supreme Court justices who had cancer and he left the chamber and I was thinking of Supreme Court justice, and then he has chamber, the courthouse, and then he leaves because he has cancer, and his whole world is over. All the law books, all his power, all his influence, all his money, every, all his right, I mean, everything that he's done, his life is ended, and he leaves the earth. You can think of people that have billions of dollars of wealth, and none of it is going and everything that people do on this earth some great things but it's over and it ends some are not that fortunate but they have a life and they say goodbye to their family or maybe they have no family but it's over everything that's all gone imagine that everyone in this room every one of us we're, we're not taking any family member no buildings, no bank accounts, nothing, not all of it. It is all gone. Imagine we're all alone going to be with God. And with God, we are joined to amazing people, amazing people when we go to heaven, amazing people, amazing place, amazing. But now Job is at the very low point here with all this bad news and he sees it this way because because it is real it is what is the difference between the early job and the later job is that job knows job has been spoken to job has been comforted job has had some revelation Job has matured. Job is more of a servant than he was in the beginning. In the beginning, he is a servant. God said, he is my servant. And Satan said, no, he isn't. And at the end of the story, he is. More so, more than ever. He is a servant. He knows the whole thing. I wonder where he will be at in heaven God said, what he went through on the earth had a immeasurable value. Our, our suffering cannot be compared with the glory that will, will follow in Romans 8. And that's, is that what it is, Lord? Here, here's another thing. <laughs> here's another thing. Um, The modern world says to God, why is there suffering? Why is there suffering? And then God says to us, like, why are you living? Why are you living? Is that good? We say, why the suffering? And the Lord said basically to Job, can you answer some questions I have? Can I, could you answer, where were you when I made the universe, you know? Like, it's not, it's not to be seen like an arrogant son. It's God is not arrogant. God is loving and compassionate, but he's trying to shift it another way. I am not in trial. I am God. But I want to ask you, because my questions will help you orient, orient, orient yourself to reality. And that is, so why are you alive? And the answer is really, Lord, I am alive to glorify you, Revelation 4.11. I am alive 
because I can see you in the good times and the bad times. I believe I can see you. In Egypt as a slave, he wasn't, I'm not saying that, but in prison like Paul, in, in trouble, I, I just think this is what the message is. I have not mastered it, I do not know. I know what I am saying and I believe in what I'm saying, but I'm also, I'm also sharing it with you to say that uh, life, the, the life that we live in isn't so much putting God in the dock, like in the courtroom, putting him on the, on the stand, and the judge is here in a big bench, this is the bench, and we're saying to God, why is there suffering? Why did you do this to Job? Why have you done this and that? Why are there children dying of disease? And why is there poverty in the world? Why have you made the universe away? Wait, who are you? What have you done? Why have you done this? This is the modern mind. But the, real, the mind of God, Christ, is the other way. Christ is on the, the and he puts us here on the witness stand, and he says, why are you alive? What are you doing on the earth? What is your purpose? Why are you walking on the earth? And, now, and our answer is, I am made in the image of God. I am made as a worshiper of God. That God is my comforter and God is my father. And I'm walking here in the world in the good times and the bad times, trusting in him with all my heart. That's what I believe I'm doing on the earth. And God would say, very good answers. Very good, you must have been taught by greater grace. <laughs> you must be a Bible reader. You must be a servant. If, you, if God was to say to Christ, who was on the, in over here uh, uh, being, uh, being accused, Christ, who are you? He'd say, Father, I am your servant. I'll trust you always. I believe in you. Yeah, but even if I have you hanging on a cross, yes, Father, I will trust you. I may cry out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But in my heart, I will believe in you and trust you with all my heart, all the days of my life while I walk on the earth. And I will manifest the reality of who you are in a dark world. And the father would say, come up and sit at my right hand. You are the savior of the world. You are the one that is answering correctly. You're living for that purpose. And that's the way, that's the big difference between God being my servant. God, why did you do this? Why did you do that? Who are you? Why? What is it? God being my servant versus us being his servant. So we overcome the devil. We do. He is shamed. Hey, devil, you archangel fallen. You can't deal with us, dust, like bumbling along, bleeding, and crying, whining, hurting. You cannot deal with us. You cannot get a hold of us. Martin Luther once said, the devil knocked at his door, and Martin Luther said, who are you looking for? The devil said, I'm looking for Martin Luther. And Martin Luther said, he's not home. Christ lives in this house. And Christ answered the door and the devil said, where is Martin Luther? And Christ said, he has died and he's hidden with Christ in God. How do we overcome the devil? By the word, by the reality of our heart and mind thinking like this. And we can take it and we can handle it. In some measure, we fall, we stumble. Job had a terrible time, miserable time, but he overcame. And so God is going to have you overcome too. And I would say to anybody going through any of these troubles, it's like give yourself time, process it. There's no pressure. God is a loving God, peace-loving peace God, gracious God the comforter, the reality, the one we need. I need a church. I need the word. I need love. We all need that. And the people around us need it. Let's invite them.
Let's spend time with them. I spent time with one brother from Harvard to Grace today who is coming here now, and I'm just encouraged meeting somebody who's like hungry for this, hungry for this, you know, coming out of the other world, other lifestyle, and saying, I, I want it. And he sees it because he sees you. When he sees you, he sees the group of people who are working at getting it somehow right, not perfect, but somehow. We say, Jesus, Jesus is the way. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> the Justin, good to see you, Justin, my son here. God bless you in the Fed Hill. Let's keep Fed Hill in prayer. Lord, thank you. I didn't get to call him that much this week, but. Lord, for Pastor Justin, Federal Hill, all the folks, for also Frederick, Pastor Dennis White, they, all these folks need prayer, Pastor Wright and Hobbit of Grace, Pastor Shibley in Silver Spring, uh, Manny Harrison and Glenn Burney. Yeah, we, these are our precious people, James Bryson, uh, Ronaldo Brown and Owings Mills. He's in Africa at the moment. Uh, Utica, Pastor Lewis passed away. Let me, let me say amen to my prayer. I just tell you that Pastor Lewis, Kevin Lewis passed away uh, yesterday morning at 4 o'clock in the morning. He's been battling cancer for more than a year. And um, he was amazing. Oh, I'll tell you, I could cry. Because he's in Utica, Rome, New York is the next town. I would go up and see my mom, and I'd always met Kevin at the Dunkin' Donuts for talking and friendship. He was amazing. Sleepy Hollow, church elder, faithful servant. I just stayed with greater grace when we had our troubles. He goes, no, I, I love this ministry. And he was the only one out of that board of elders. And was a great friend to me, and I just appreciated him a lot. So pray for his wife, Renee, and his son, Kawan, and the future of the work in Utica. Okay, Lord Jesus, anyone listening to my voice, it's a serious world out there. It's a serious world, but your Heavenly Father, the one that made you, loves you. He's with you. He cares about you. You need his son to justify you, make you righteous. You need the son of God in your heart, in your life, to trust in him. And immediately, he, he's there for you. Yes, receive him tonight. And then for the dear people in Maine and their suffering, we pray for the ministry of Christ there, because some searching hearts, some searching hearts will come to you. And we just pray for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, welcome, Pastor Shibley. You want to turn to each other, talk for a minute? Go ahead. Hi everybody. I love the I love this church. It's a great church. 
Is there anyone here for the very first time tonight? Would you raise your hand if you're here for the first? Hey, good to have you guys. Thank you for raising your hand. I feel like I've accomplished something already. I think we have a visitor or a guest packet for you guys. And here comes our, one of our ushers right now. Is there anybody else? Over here we have some, hey, hey, wow. So we hit the jackpot tonight. We have uh, somebody here. Thank you so much for coming and hearing our pastor and whoever brought you. Praise the Lord. Um, 1968 years ago, I think it was, the Apostle Paul wrote the uh, book of 2 Corinthians. Um, the, the Paul, Paul was uh, quite a guy. And um, this was in the first century, of course. And it's very interesting. All of chapter 9 of... We're going to talk about the offering. Oh, that's right, too. We're talking... Thank you for receiving those packets. But uh, we're going to talk about the offering. And uh, chapter 9 of Second Corinthians is all about giving. And it's very interesting how Paul starts it off. He's so... It's kind of funny, you know? Like, he's, he's talking to this church that had given him a lot of trouble. Paul planted the church in Corinth. And, um, but what he does is he's kind of joking with him. He said, hey, I've been bragging about you guys, that you are very good givers. And so I'm sending some people in preparation for my visit, and then we're going to take some of your money and distribute it throughout Macedonia. And it's so interesting because Paul just like brags on them. He says, but you better make sure that you live up to what I bragged to you about. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. <laughs> and they did. I think so. Uh, uh, verse 6 of 2 Corinthians chapter 9, written by Paul. But I say to you, he who sows sparingly, he gets into some teaching, will also reap sparingly. He who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, but listen to this, for God loves a cheerful giver. And I like it because sometimes giving, we think it is grudging, right? We don't want to give necessarily... But I, I find that there is great joy in giving. And I find there's like great freedom when we don't worry about it so much. And then somehow God does this great blessing in our lives. Because when you look, he does his little teaching. But then when you look down at verse 10, he says this. He says, now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed which you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. This is all about money, actually, what he's talking about. But he says, like, the, the money that we put in the offering, it's like seeds. And then it's going to reproduce, and it's actually it's going to bless people, but it's also going to bless us, ultimately. This is not a prosperity gospel, but it is a prosperity gospel, the prosperity of grace, right? We're not talking about becoming super rich or anything like that or never having, to, having a need or whatever. But... It is speaking about God giving us an increase uh, in grace. And the grace that he's speaking about is the grace of finances. It's very interesting because he would say this, well, you are enriched in everything and in all liberality, which causes thanksgiving uh, uh, through us to God. Then he says, for the administration of the service not only supplies the needs of the saints, but is also abounding through many thanksgivings to God. And so uh, tonight we're just going to pray for our offering. Thank you for giving to the ministry. Thank you for giving to God's work. And uh, we're going to pray right now that God would bless this time of giving this evening. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for these words by the Apostle Paul. And thank you so much, Lord God, that we don't have to be grudging, but actually receive joy in giving. And we're also blessing other people in that way. And so I pray for those who are uh, who have gotten new jobs, and I'm so happy for them. And I pray that you would continue to bless them. Thank you for answering their prayers. And also for those who are looking for jobs and those who might need a blessing uh, in their job, an increase in that way. I pray, Lord God, that you would do that for the people in our church. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's welcome the singers. honor and a privilege to be up here after so many years. Um, August 5th, 2001, I was sitting right around in there, and I heard the door of heaven open up for the first time, and I received that mercy and that grace, which I so desperately needed, and I got that firm foundation of the Word of God right here. So uh, 
Just want to be thankful for that. Thank you for coming. We are dismissed. God bless you. Father, thank you so much. You've met us once again. We bless you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We will continue with a time of prayer and praise. Um, if you have children in the nursery, this is the time to relieve our nursery workers. Thank you very much. We are dismissed.
Heavenly Father, thank you for the way you've visited us tonight once again with your clear presence. You've spoken and you've manifested yourself through your word and by your spirit, and we want to thank you. Lord, we're asking you to lead us in these next few moments as we seek your face. And it's what you told us to do in the scripture. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold your beauty, the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in his temple. Father, that's our prayer for tonight. Lead us. Uh, we want to behold your beauty, to see you in the beauty of holiness. We want to inquire, to ask questions, hard questions of you, knowing that you delight in giving us the desire of our heart. And Lord, our, our chief desire, our desire above all else, we want it to be you. Who do we have in heaven but you? There is none that we desire on earth beside you. Lead us, Lord, by your free spirit, by your good spirit. You lead your people like a flock. Lead us, Lord, by your good spirit. Lord, if there is any agitation, any anxiety, any illegitimate cares, Lord, and cause us to still our hearts and where we cannot, would you quiet us in your love? Be still and know that I am God. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon me because he trusts in me. The work of righteousness will be peace and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. Lord, we commit these moments to you. Quiet our hearts and fill our eyes, the eyes of our hearts with wonder tonight of who you are, standing in awe. Thank you, Lord.
believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. but are mighty through God for the pulling down of fortresses, of strongholds. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Lord, thank you for where we have been placed in Christ, hidden, dead to sin, and safe in the cleft of the rock, in the secret place of the Most High. Thank you for our position, Lord, seated above with you. Satan being cast down beneath our feet, the wicked one touching us not. Greater are you in us, greater than he who is in the world. Thank you, Father. Lord, help each one of us to be conscious of this hidden realm, of the spiritual warfare, of the spiritual battle, and of the effect of prayer, of crying out to you, of placing quiet confidence in you of making our requests known to you and delighting in you in the process. Lead us, Lord. Show us how to pray when we don't know how, when it's just a, a groan or a shout or a word, the word, your name, the name of Jesus Christ that has so much authority and power. Help us to flee iniquity 
I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But you have heard us, and we say, blessed is your name. You've heard us, Lord. You have not removed our prayer nor your mercy from us. Thank you for the shout of victory, for the answer prayer. Thank you, Lord. For the blockage that is done away with, for the breakthrough. Thank you, Lord, for the breakthrough in prayer. This sense that you are present and we are in contact with the Almighty. Thank you, Lord. Lead us, Lord, by your good spirit. Lead us. Father, we pray for your, your servants tonight, those who are sharing the gospel. We pray for your workers, Lord, your servants. Give them strength and courage and power and joy and a, a lightness, yet an incredible sense of urgency for the shortness of the time. And we pray for a, a harvest, Lord, like we've never known in these dark days. Thank you, Lord. Bless, encourage your servants with vision and purpose. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And Lord, we just want to pray like David prayed, search me, O God, know my heart, try me, know my thoughts, see if there's any wicked way in me, show me the way everlasting. Lord, reveal to us blind spots, flood them with light. We want to grow. Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. We want to grow in areas where there's apathy. May we have hunger and thirst that we would be filled, filled, Lord. Thank you. When peace like a attended my
with your thinking. We are blessed. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Jesus. We just know that you have answered so many prayers. That life is happening the way it is today because of your grace on us. You have not given us entirely over to the darkness of this world. But you've translated us into the kingdom of your son, 
and and we are in a, in the presence of enemies, but you prepare a table for us. And you also tell us to pray, and you answer our prayers. And you retard evil and bind it. They, the, um, the strong man is bound so that we can go into the house and take the captives out. There are a lot of captives, Lord, in this world. There's a lot of people that are in bondage and they're captive. And we are praying tonight for your people, your servants, your people, their, your message, your work on the earth. We pray for the United States of America, Lord. We have a history of turning to you. Turn us again. Turn us again. We repent of our sins. Turn us, please, Lord. Turn us again. Bring a revival in our country, Lord. The devil would be shocked at how many people can turn to you because when he shows his hand, we are horrified when we see his diabolical mind, his evil, to destroy families, to pervert the sexuality of people, to lie brazenly without shame and arrogance. Yeah, turn us, Lord, as a people, turn us like from Baal, to you. Yeah, you are, yes, Lord, please hear our prayers. Pray for the government in D.C. Pray for the, the workings. Pray for the godly people that are in the government that are fighting a good fight. They are ridiculed. They are attacked. They are, they are slandered. They are put down. They are overlooked. They are mocked. They are ridiculed. They are they, the works of evil that happen amongst people that are in power. And may they be especially anointed to do their job, to speak about Jesus Christ, to magnify God, to tell people to turn to God. May our government change and turn, turn to God and tell people to turn to God. And then it doesn't happen there, but it happens in the governor's house. Um, uh, governors, ships, and capital cities and states. It happens in the athletics. It happens on the field. Help uh, happens at the university. Please bring. And then we'll be very bold. The devil is filled with arrogance, and may his work be turned on its head. And the Lord in heaven is laughing in Psalm two. Where, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing against the Lord and his anointed? Yes, why? Because they are energized by the God of this world. Please hear our prayer tonight. Bless our missionaries with freshness. Bless our pastors with freshness and authority. Bless the families of Pastor. Bless Renee Lewis, who lost her husband. That family, please, Lord. Bless the, the pastors, the workers, the missionaries, the single ladies that walk with you and, and, and walk a godly, godly life of, of dedication and service to you. Reward them, power, shower them with blessing, pour it on. All our churches, they would multiply in number and double in size, and blessings would be upon them, and there would be salvations in the churches, Lord, and healings in the churches, and the testimony of Christ among your people. Lord God, we pray for this. Oh, Lord God, for youth pastors, for a wave of young people to come into churches, Lord. The work of grace, oh God, in our neighborhoods like never before in our neighborhoods that people would be touched and reach and help us to reach them and have a strategy from the Holy Spirit of love and care in the holiday season and bring new people into this church and bless it richly, Lord, in every way. 
Keep us from evil, Lord. Keep us in humility. Keep us in the faith. Answer our prayers, Lord. Women's Bible studies, um, meetings, counseling, recovery, total recovery. Every one of them, total recovery. We pray, God, our day school, spirit-filled hallways, oh, spirit-filled teachers, spirit-filled words, spirit-filled gymnasium, spirit-filled teams and coaching, uh, spirit-filled cookouts, spirit-filled youth groups, spirit-filled everything, spirit-filled, Lord, young adults, God. Please, in our homes, bless our homes, Lord. Keep our homes free from weird things. Keep our homes pure and clean and godly. Keep our homes spirit-filled. Keep our houses filled with praises and Christian music and edification and love and faith. Keep our, our families together. Keep our families together. The devil divides and does his work in the hearts of people putting his seed in the hearts of people. But please keep us and lead us. And when we fail, rebound and recovery. Yeah, fill us with your spirit all the time. We pray. Thank you, Lord. The hallways at NBCNS, every class, every teacher, special anointing this week, special joy, God. Real, a lot of joy, a lot of praise, a lot of thanksgiving in our hearts, Lord. Refresh us, God. Yes, Lord, Jesus' name, we pray. Lord, thank you, God. Lord, I I want to ask just for three things. And I know you can do them, Lord, for uh, a a lady in our church, Lord, who is going through a lot of medical issues, but they don't know what's wrong with her, God, until the tests all come back. And for Gina, it's Gina Gallo. And I pray, God, that you would just work in her life and and her body, I'm sorry, and just help her, Lord God, to be healed. Lord Jesus, touch her, I pray, in every way. Lord, touch her. And then another lady in our church, Lindy, who has not only a brain aneurysm, but a problem on her uh, her artery in her neck, Lord Jesus, and uh, that it could be bad. And I just pray, God, that you would heal her as well. Lord, do a great work in her body. Lord, we thank you so much for her. And then also for a young lady in our church who, who this morning had a miscarriage, God, and it was a big deal. And I just pray, God, that you comfort her, bless her and her husband and her family. Jesus, thank you for their lives. And uh, I do ask, God, that you would bring comfort and, and, and freedom and peace in their lives, Lord Jesus, in your precious name. Amen. You know, I have the mic, and I'm happy to bring it to you. If you just motion, I can come to where you are. So feel free to let me know. We have many pastors here tonight. Um, it would be a blessing for us as the body of Christ to hear your prayers for the work you're involved with. Hi, my name is Sean uh, L. Whitehead. Uh, I've uh, been deep in prayer uh, lately. Uh, uh, about Kim, uh, triple sevens. Uh, I've been praying for uh, Judah, uh, tribe of Judah, and uh, tribe of Jacob. Uh, God has some new things for them uh, as far as Israel, and uh, I just wanted to let that be known. Need prayer. Father, we pray for Teresa. You know the, the needs of her heart. And we just, as a body praying together for her, ask you for blessing and guidance and wisdom. 
thank you, Lord. Father, we, we trust you. and We believe in you because you're our God. Thank you, Lord. We praise you. I'm just uh, looking at who is living in New Jersey and moving down to my area 15 minutes away. She's handicapped, and um, she needs to, she's at the place where she can't do anything much on her own, so um, she, we're getting her to move down here. But I, I ask that you would, the body would just pray for the details of it and that it would go smoothly because she's, you know, in her 80s and she's very nervous and anxious about it. And I just want her to find peace and joy and the love of the body when she comes down. So that's my big prayer. Father, first we thank you so much because because all of our days were written in your book before even one of them came to be. You have all power in heaven and earth. And thank you, Lord. Lord, we want to, I, I want to lift up a, a young lady who's pregnant and single and looking for a place to stay. And uh, just that you would lead her and guide her and especially, Lord, draw her to yourself. And then a, another young woman, um, I think she still has an abortion planned, and uh, that you would that you would just open her eyes and her heart, and uh, and give her your heart towards her child. Thank you, Lord and Father. Thank you. We pray that you would uh, you would really raise up laborers, send out laborers, Lord, here in Baltimore and Glen Burnie and all around, Lord that you would draw people out of their comfort zone to take steps of faith, to, to walk with you, to take, take spots of uh, leadership where you're calling them, and to, uh, and to reach this neighborhood, to reach this city, Lord, to reach the lost. And we, there's so many opportunities, Lord. We just give you thanks for calling us to be part of your your plan, part of your your reaching of, of souls. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I'd like to pray for Diego, who has a reoccurrence of cancer in his lower back. Uh, he's a very young man, Lord. I just pray for uh, wisdom for the medical people who are attending to him, Lord. I pray for his salvation, for his brother Carlos, the whole family, Lord. I just pray for a turning to you. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just want to lift up all of the um, spiritual leaders in our country, uh, not just greater grace, but all of those that name the name of Christ and are preaching sound doctrine, the grace message, Lord. We just pray for them, lift them up to you, that you would uh, strengthen them in their inner man, that you would give them a good discernment in these days that we're living in, that you would give them understanding in your word, that there would be an increase of understanding that you would uh, also supply them with a few good men, like some mighty men, to be a check and a balance for them so they could finish well. We also ask, Lord, that you would draw people that are hungry for truth, that you would draw them to those churches. You know where they are in our country, that um, there would be shepherds for lost sheep, and we ask, also ask for an increase in their congregation, Lord. We pray for, again for salvations in the services. And Lord, we ask for encouragement too, that you would, those that are discouraged, Lord, that you would comfort them and encourage them through your word. We also pray for maybe places where the word of God has been neglected or even lost, that you would speak to the heart of those leaders 
They would find your word. They would find the book in the house of the Lord. We pray that your word would be elevated. We would present a great big Jesus Christ in our pulpits because we know, Lord, if you're lifted up, that all men will be drawn unto you. We just pray this in Jesus' name. Oh, beauty, think of who you are is overwhelming, promises you make they Every time